if you're advising my parents who are in their 70s, um, should they get their fourth dose right now because they haven't gotten it yet? Or should they wait until the bivalent comes on in the fall because you know they're trying to avoid infection or anything else? So what should they do? Should they just do it now or should they wait? First of all, it's really hard to avoid infection. It is. I mean, this is a highly contagious, these are highly contagious viruses. They're immune evasive. It's a short incubation period, mucosal respiratory infection. So it's just at some level, we're going to have to try and find a way to accept mild infection. It's because even for those who are at highest risk, what are we going to do? It boosts twice a year. It's just not a practical strategy, I think. In, In answer to your question, I guess I would wait and see what the data show. Hopefully we'll have much more vigorous, um, data regarding this sort of uh, bivalent vaccine that contains BA5, because it looks like that's the way the administration wants to go. We'll have clear data on that. And if that's true, then I would wait, because I, I really do think people make a mistake when they give boosters very close together. You really should wait several months to, to do yeah. that. So I, I disagree with the, the people who occasionally say, well, get it now, and then you can get it again later. No, wait, wait till later to see, see what, this, uh, what this BA5 looks like. All right, let's talk about vaccines and long COVID. We know we know nothing, but let's. There is certainly a concern that that this virus, this pandemic, is sort of a mass uh, event for creating disability. And even if there's a range of, uh, of of estimates on how much long COVID there is, and even if the lowest estimates are true, it's still a ton of people. Do we? Do you think we're going to going to get a readout on whether vaccines and boosts, in particular, um, help? otherwise healthy people avoid long COVID? Or is that just going to be impossible to sort out? Well, you said it. I mean, we need to define this phenomenon of long COVID. I, right now, you read estimates anywhere range from 5% of people who suffer natural infection up to 50% of people. So, and that, the, the, for example, the United States has a higher rate of long COVID than Europe does. So we have a definition problem. We, we clearly need to define it as objectively as possible because, I mean, it's a, it's a real entity. And the, the part of it that worries me is the vasculitis part. I mean, that, that, that this is a virus that can cause you to make an immune response to your own endothelial cells, you know, that line blood vessels. So therefore, all organs are at risk. So you, you do need to have define, a defined way of doing this, because now if you look at these meta-analyses, you know, the the um, the uh, symptom that seems to come up to the top most frequently is fatigue, which is hard to define. Fatigue, pain, I mean, those are whatever you say they are. You know, it's not like measuring your blood pressure or temperature. Mm -hmm. It's not so easily defined. So define it. So find a much clearer way of defining it than saying, you know, are you tired when you get up in the morning? Have you been tired for weeks? You know, because it just, it, uh, it sets itself up for for just a, a, a just a, a including far more people. And I feel sorry now for employers, for insurance companies that are now going to try and figure out how to deal with the the massive amount of disability that no doubt is going to follow um, this this uh, virus. We need to define it immunologically, virologically, and at some level psychologically. Yeah. We have to do that. We have to because it's going to be a big hit associated with this uh, diagnosis. Long COVID is obviously a concern for across the age spectrum, but a lot of young people are worried about it. But another thing that uh, a group of people that are really maybe a relatively low risk, but really of our concern is an area of great interest in your career. And this is pediatrics and, and kids. What's your stance on pediatric vaccines? And how do you respond to the idea that COVID either isn't that bad for kids, so they don't need a vaccine, or maybe even if it is on a population level, too many have been exposed anyway, so why do it? Like, where, where, where are we on, on pediatric COVID vaccines? Right, well, so we all have our biases. I guess mine is that I work at a children's hospital. So I do see children come into our hospital who suffer this disease. And, and if you look sort of just at the, the data that we were presented at the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee when we made this decision in mid-June about um, vaccines for the less than five-year-old, it is clear that there are at least millions of children who've been infected who are less than five years of age. It's also clear that at least children have been hospitalized. And if you look at their data, their, the CDC data are young, thousands and thousands have been hospitalized. And according to CDC data, about 200 have died from this virus. Um, now, you, you want to make sure you have good data there. Is it that they're, they're getting hospitalized or dying with this virus or from this virus? We, we need to make that very clear. And I think that's a little less clear. But um, that 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 I certainly say that we see at our hospital children who come into our hospital um, because they have COVID or treated because they have COVID, some of whom end up in the intensive care unit. So it, it is a it's real. Um, and, and for that reason, it should be prevented. And and so is it. So then the question becomes, when's the best time to vaccinate? Because if you would make the, the assumption that this virus can, can cause uh, death at any age, which is true, if you make the assumption that this virus is going to be with us for years, if not decades, which I think is also true, 
Then the question is when to vaccinate, because every year in this country, three and a half to more four million children are brought into this world in this country who are fully susceptible to this virus. And this virus is going to be around for a long time. So uh, we're going to need to have a high level of population immunity to protect them. So when to vaccinate, I would argue now in worst case scenario, it may be that if you find that that memory responses, which are associated generally with protection against severe disease, fade after five years or 10 years, and you need to to uh, revaccinate later, fine. But at least you've protected them during that period of time. Can I ask you a, a clinical impression? I'll set it up by sharing a little bit of mine. Early 2020, COVID pneumonia on every x-ray. They come in and they just, wow, this is a crazy x-ray. Why do I keep seeing this thing? And then in the Delta and Omicron sort of period where you had a lot of people coming into the hospital, even though they were vaccinated, that group didn't have COVID pneumonia. They had uh, they were being hospitalized for emphysema, but COVID exacerbated it. So it's COVID's fault, but it's not COVID pneumonia. Um, what do you see in kids who get who are unvaccinated who get hospitalized? Are they having that COVID pneumonia like I was seeing in early 2020, or is it a kid who's dehydrated who just can't go home? No, I, I was on service a few weeks ago, and um, we saw an an adolescent unvaccinated who came in who clearly had COVID pneumonia. I mean, he was sick and he, you know, required supplemental oxygen. His, his uh, oxygen saturation levels were low. If you looked at his, his uh, x-ray and his CT scan, it was striking and clearly COVID pneumonia. And what do you say to people who are out there saying, look, uh, this is so rare. We don't need to make kids have to get vaccinated. They don't have hypoxia, you know, the down players, like, wow, how do you reach them? What do you say to them? It's not rare enough. Uh, you know, I think if, if it was, you know, this was like rhinovirus and it's basically a common cold virus and, you know, you're, it's not the kind of thing that's going to cause you to be hospitalized or go to the ICU or die, fine. But it's not that virus. This virus is much scarier. And, and the scariest aspect to me is this, you know, MIS-C, this multi-system inflammatory disease of children, which is striking. You know, you, you have a child typically between five and 13 years of age, average nine years of age, who comes in, usually has a, a fairly trivial infection that was picked up serendipitously because they were exposed to a friend or family member. A month later, they come back. They're not shedding virus. They're antigen negative or PCR negative. They're, you know, but what they have is they have um, high fever. They have evidence of pulmonary disease, you know, kidney disease, heart disease, liver disease, it is a, a frightening illness, occasionally die. It's, it's, that is a post-infectious inflammatory disease that is caused by a respiratory virus, and I haven't seen anything like that before. Um, that's, that, to me, is the most compelling reason to get vaccinated, actually, because it's just so different from what you normally see. And, and, but, you know, this virus can cause severe illness. Yes, it's, it's relatively rare, but it certainly compares to the other viruses for which we have vaccines. I yeah. mean, if you're willing to get a polio vaccine or a flu vaccine or a chickenpox vaccine or a measles vaccine, I mean, this virus compares to those in terms of uh, how likely it is to kill you. We're running out of time, but I, I can't resist. Why, why is it that MISC, this multi-inflammatory syndrome in children, seems to have gone down in incidence in the Delta and Omicron period? This is a tremendous relief, but why do we think that happened? It has. I mean, I think there was the data on out of South Africa regarding Omicron and subvariants is that the MIS-C is definitely less common. Um, you would have to argue that the price that the virus is paying to be more contagious, which is to say the uh, the mutations that are associated with immune evasiveness are also associated with a lesser virulence. That's which, which favors spread of the virus, actually. Right. right. That's That's right. because in theory, if you anthropomorphize the virus, it's never to the virus's advantage to kill you. I mean, if it wants to, if it wants to live, and presumably it does, um, then it, it it's easier to spread from person to person if it, if you're not dead. Right. At the extremes, uh, the symptomatology has some impact on the reproductive number, but only at the extremes. Other than that, a little bit more virulent, a little bit less, it doesn't matter. Um, I think you are the perfect person to ask this, what I think will be my final question. And that is that when, whenever we are looking at a therapeutic or a vaccine or any intervention, we have to balance in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pandemic environment, you have to balance the need to act with incomplete information in an emergency setting versus waiting until you have enough data that says this is a safe, effective, and even cost-effective approach. How do you balance that? I sense that your balance is a little bit more towards the second one when you sense it's safe to wait. But how do we how do you tell people to make that balance? Because most people are saying, oh, we got to act. We got to act. Forget it. No time for data. Right. Good question. 
Um, and we, we on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, we, we continued to face that ever since December of 2020, um, especially for the childhood vaccines. I mean, we for the, the vaccine to less than five year old, because the, que the, the question is never, when do you know everything? Because you never know everything. The question is, when do you know enough? When do you cross that line where you feel comfortable that you know enough, knowing there's always a human price to pay for knowledge? I mean, if you go back to December 2020, there was a death in that placebo group. Uh, associated with that. I, mean, I give a lot of credit to these parents who volunteer for these trials, knowing their child may be injected with, with a placebo, knowing that their child may suffer the disease because of that decision. And the same for us, you know, because the decision not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice. It's just a choice to take a different risk. And our goal is to try and figure out to advise parents or, or others to take the lesser risk. And I'll just add one story because I'm an old person, as you can see, this is a video. Um, but, you know, I'm, so I'm a child of the 50s. Um, and, you know, if you look at but that look at the polio vaccine story. I mean, so we always hail Jonas Salk as, as rightfully as, as you know, a, a critical researcher in the development of the polio vaccine. When we did that trial, when, when the, the Thomas Francis ran that so-called Francis Field trial of the polio vaccine between 1954 and 1955, you had 1.2 uh, million children who were, uh, who, who, uh, who were vaccinated ultimately. It was about uh, 400,000 children were vaccinated with the inactivated vaccine, 200,000 received um, the placebo, received placebo, a placebo shot. And, and, one, and, uh, eight, and, and so you had another 1.2 million children who were observed on inactivated controls. It was like a 1.8 million child study, a huge study. Um, Jonas Salk didn't want to do that study. He didn't. He felt he'd, he'd vaccinated 700 children in the Pittsburgh area. He thought that the immune response was excellent. He couldn't, it was an inactivated vaccine. He could not imagine that, 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 they would, that anyone should ever do a trial with a placebo. He couldn't conscience that trial. The 1.2 million children who were observed uninoculated were really a, a, a sort of a nod to him. He did not want to inoculate children with placebo. In, in the mid 1950s, knowing that every year 20 to 30,000 children suffered paralysis and that every year about 1,500 children died of polio. So when Thomas Francis gets up and he makes the announcement that the vaccine was safe, potent, and effective, three words that appeared on the headline of every newspaper in this country, how did he know it was effective? He knew it was effective because 16 children died of polio in that study, all in the placebo group. He knew it was effective because there were 36 children who were paralyzed in that study, 34 in the placebo group. And those were first and second graders in the 1950s. I was a first and second grader in the 1950s. Those children could have lived long, productive lives, but for the flip of a coin. There was always a human price to pay for knowledge. And that's the hardest part of all of this. And yet, if they don't do that study or they don't do the study today, how many people will die or have bad outcomes because they say, well, I'm not going to do it just because some fancy doctor said it works. People will be convinced ultimately by a combination of education through their pediatricians or through the press or even through experience where they say, look, um, every kid I know who had this bad outcome didn't have a vaccine. So eventually the anecdotal evidence kind of piles up in a way that's meaningful. Is that fair? Well, you, you, I mean, you, you're certainly right. I mean, it, you, you don't convince people without doing those kinds of studies. And, and in fact, if you look at these these two you know, mRNA vaccines, as big as those studies were that were presented back in December 2020, it was, you know, it was 40,000 for Pfizer, 30,000 for Moderna. Those are those are the size of any typical pediatric or adult vaccine trial. Still, we didn't know about myocarditis as a consequence of that vaccine or pericarditis. You knew that only when millions of children were vaccinated. And that's, I mean, Maurice Hilleman, who I consider to be the father of modern vaccines in many ways, because he did the primary research for development on nine of the 14 vaccines that we give the children said it best. He said, quote, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first 3 million doses are out there. Uh, but that's never going to be done pre-licensure so, or pre-approval. So, so, so that's how you learn. I, I mean, you know, medical innovation invariably comes with a human cost either way, in either way that you either, either because you do get the vaccine or because you don't get the vaccine. Dr. Paul Offit, thank you so much for joining us. Your analysis has been uh, almost singular in, in the public uh, conversation in terms of uh, balancing the uh, what I would call an, an exceedingly pro-vaccine stance um, while saying, insisting on excellent science so that we eventually reach the most people. So thank you for doing that and for joining us here today. My pleasure. Thank you.